Greetings, fellow human. I hope you're having a groovalicious day. My name is Baron, and in today's video, we're talking all about this guy, the Nikon Z6. I've tested it extensively. I've tested out all of its feature things. I'm gonna share the results with you, and we're gonna try and determine whether or not this is the right camera for you. Yeah. Nikon Z6 and its high megapixel big brother, the Z7, is Nikon's first attempt at full frame mirrorless. They're just jumping right in with these guys. The Z6, or Z6 if you nasty, or from some place other than the United States, or both. Could you could be both. The Z6 has a 24.5 full frame backside illuminated sensor, and that means it will illuminate your butt. That's not really what it means. It's got a brand new X-Speed 6 processor to process things. And it has the brand spanking new Z-mount that was designed so they could, you know, look forward into the future and design lenses that take full advantage of the mirrorless technology. It's got a hybrid autofocus system with 273 phase detection points that cover the entire screen thing from the upper corner to the bottom corner and, you know, up there with you woo raise that autofocus point roof the autofocus isn't really all that bad it's actually pretty decent i actually got great results in most situations it was just a few situations that kind of let me down single point focus was very very snappy super fast and seemed to be pretty accurate i didn't have any problems with it at all and you can do the touch to focus on the back of the screen and it was pretty fast I liked it. Low light focusing was a real issue. It did a lot of hunting. It didn't matter if I was shooting video or photos, just all kinds of hunting. I tried all the different modes and selections for the autofocus, but a lot of times I ended up switching to manual focus just so I could get the shot. It also gave me some problems if I'm shooting a subject that's heavily backlit. As far as continuous autofocus goes, there is face detection, which works well if the subject is well lit and is not moving too quickly. I shot this example just to illustrate this point. Now, in this situation, I have the face tracking going and it's having a hard time seeing my face because I'm backlit. Now here, I've added a light to light my face and it has no problem at all. I can run all over the place and it tracks me just fine. It also has a subject tracking mode, which works a little bit better, but still the same things apply. It's gotta be, you know, fairly well lit and it can't be moving that fast. With moving subjects, I had the most success with the dynamic area option, which doesn't actually track the subject. I had to track the subject with the camera itself, keeping it in the little dynamic area. And that seemed to work really well. In fact, that was very, very consistent. Now, Nikon claims that you can get 12 frames per second bursts, and I didn't find this to be the case. I got about nine or 10 frame per second bursts. And what I was saying earlier about the autofocus tracking, it became really apparent here. Here I was using the face detection and it couldn't keep up at all. I don't think there was but one or two frames out of this entire burst that was in focus. Now I ran this test several times just to see if I was gonna get consistent results and I did not. It was very inconsistent. Sometimes I got several shots that were in focus and other times I got no shots that were in focus. It was very inconsistent but it wasn't actually any good in any of the tests. And as you can see it doesn't change to face tracking until it gets closer to the camera. So face tracking is definitely not something that you would want to use in a situation like this. Now here I I've switched over to the subject tracking and it's doing a ton better. Now this system kept up way, way better than face tracking. As you can see here, I got a whole lot more of the shots in focus. Now the little tracking box that's supposed to stay on them, it doesn't look like it can keep up with them at all. It's lagging behind them. However, as you can see with the results, you know, it's obviously keeping up with them because a lot of the shots are actually in focus. Now here I decided I was gonna try out the electronic shutter in the high burst rate mode. Get as many of these shots as possible. I left it on subject tracking mode and as you can see, I got most of the shots in focus. I have no idea why this is, but I tested this several times. Now I thought that was really weird. Why would it work better with the electronic shutter than it did with the mechanical shutter? That historically is just not how that works. But I ran the same test over and over again and it kept giving me the same results. 
way, way better results. I got most of the shots were keepers. Now, when we're in the extended high burst rate mode with the electronic shutter, the tracking box looks like it has an even harder time keeping up with the subject. However, all of the shots were in focus, and I do mean all of them, so obviously it was tracking him well, and it was a little distracting having that box lag so far behind. So I needed to make it a little bit harder for the camera to keep up, so I took the camera off of the tripod and panned with the subject as he was running by, and it still got a great result. Lots of keepers. In fact, I think almost all but one was in focus. So this is awesome. That's a decent workaround. I can use the electronic shutter to get a much better keeper rate if I'm shooting burst mode. But there's always a catch. So look at these frames here. You can see that the rolling shutter is really, really bad. So keep that in mind. If you're using the electronic shutter, be really careful because it's pretty bad rolling shutter. I mean, it's not the worst but it's not the best. It's got a three inch 2.1 million dot touchscreen doohickey thing. Uh, it doesn't do the flipping. It's not a fully articulating flippy screen. It just tilts up and tilts down, which is a little annoying. And I know a lot of people say, you know, photographers don't want the flippy screens, but when I'm shooting photos, I use it constantly. It doesn't need to flip all the way around, but that weird little Fuji thing where it goes like halfway in the, that is super useful. And I actually really missed that with this camera. I don't like having to lay down flat on my stomach in order to get a shot from a low angle. I shoot low angle a lot, and I, I really like having the flippy screen so I can compose my image more comfortably. The touch screen itself was super responsive. I didn't have any issues with that. It actually seemed, you know, up to date, modern feeling, that sort of thing. The quality of the screen itself was decent. I didn't really have an issue with it, except I will make the note that it did seem to have a color cast to it on the green side. In certain lighting situations, even after I would set a custom white balance, the screen itself looked slightly green. Now, when I got the images back in post, they didn't have that problem. The white balance was set correctly, but the screen itself kind of threw me off a little bit. So, there's that. If you dive into the menu system, there is an option for you to actually change the tint and the contrast and that sort of thing of the screen itself. I didn't take the opportunity to do that. It just didn't come up. I didn't have time during the shoot in order to make those adjustments and feel comfortable with the result. So, but you can. Speaking of the menu system, it's not bad at all. It's not crazy deep with a million different tabby things and you're scrolling for like nine years to find one setting. It, it's set up pretty intelligently for a camera menu system. It's definitely not as crazy as the Sony or even the Olympus weirdness, but it's not great either. It's not the easiest one. I think Canon still has the easiest menus. The EVF on the Z6 is a 3.6 million dot OLED display. The refresh rate on it was just fine. It didn't feel choppy or weird or pixelated or anything. The EVF is actually scooched back far enough from the screen that when I put it up to my eye, it doesn't squish my nose which is good because I have a larger nose and I don't like squishing my nose if I can avoid it. So that's a good thing. And since we're talking about the myriad of screens that are just, you know, all over this camera, let's talk about the top panel display. So this nifty little screen on the top is going to show you all of your settings that you have just at a glance. So in case you don't happen to be looking at the back screen or through the viewfinder, you know what all of your settings are. Now, this is a function that I didn't use at all. In fact, I don't think I looked at this little panel one time the entire time I was using this camera. But I know a lot of the top end DSLRs have this screen and those guys are used to having that there and it can be useful for them, if not just familiar. The quality of the screen seemed fine. You could read everything easily. It didn't seem to draw too much battery power. So all in all, I don't use it, but I think it's pretty cool. It also has in-body image stabilization on the sensor, IBIS if you want to call it. I can't remember what, you know, the Nikon marketing terminology for it is, but it actually works in conjunction with, you know, the Z-mount lenses. So you can have five axes of stabilization, which is actually pretty awesome. I found that the stabilization on the Z6 is one of the best, if not the best, of the image stabilization systems on full-frame cameras. It's it's 
amazingly good. It's not going to be as good as the systems that are in the smaller censored Micro Four Thirds systems like the GH5 or the Olympus cameras, but for full frame, this is really impressive. I took this shot as a test to see how well the stabilization was going to work when I have a slower shutter speed handheld. And as you can see, it was really, really sharp, and I was standing in the middle of the road and there was traffic behind me. It was incredibly dangerous and stupid of me to do this, so I probably wasn't even you know, as, as steady as I could have been, but the stabilization did a great job, so I guess all of my dangerous effort was uh, well worth it for that test. I'm an idiot. It also works very well when you're shooting video. I could shoot most things handheld. I didn't need a tripod as long as I was careful. Now, obviously, it's not going to replace a glide cam or a gimbal or something like that. Here, I tried to walk with it, and you can see it's still, it's still a little shaky. But like I said before, I haven't seen another full-frame camera that performed this well with the stabilization. It's really, really good. Now, I know a lot of people kind of freaked out when this camera came out because there's only one card slot and you know I will confirm that there is only one card slot a second card slot did not magically appear when these cameras were released I I wanted that to be the case but unfortunately it's just the one and to make matters even more exciting that single card slot is not an SD card slot it is an XQD card slot a completely different kind of media one of the biggest benefits of the XQD card format is that because it has such a faster write speed you're gonna have you're gonna clear that buffer super fast because it's just gonna be able to write the images to the card that much faster I don't know why am I there are not a whole lot of cameras that support the XQD card, so you're not going to get the same inexpensive prices as the SD cards. There just aren't as many of these XQDs flying around. However, apparently XQD cards are quite a bit more like durable than an SD card. And for those of you that are concerned that the XQD format is going to die off, you can rest easy knowing that all the cameras as well as the, I think, believe the cards as well, are compatible with the new upcoming format, the CFast Express format, which is even faster than XQD, apparently. And everybody seems to be way more excited about that, so I I think that we're going to see a lot more camera manufacturers and other devices as well adopting that particular format. Nikon has stated that very soon in the future, the Z6 will have a firmware update so that it will be compatible with both the XQD card and the CFast card in this camera as well. The overall ergonomics of the Z6 are incredibly comfortable. I am very impressed with how nice the camera feels in the hand. All the button placement is really, really good. You can get to everything that you need to get to super comfortably and super fast. Look how nice and deep the grip is. I had no problems with this. Now these two function buttons that are right here are a little bit awkward to get to, but I didn't have an issue with them. I found them to be very, very comfortable. And once I got used to their placement, I used them very easily and I used them a lot. I'm a big fan of the little joysticks to move my autofocus point. And the joystick on the Z6 is a little bit weird. It's not as comfortable. It's, it feels a little spongy and it's a little flat but it worked fine. I didn't really have an issue with it. I just wish it was more like other joysticks, but I'm being, kind of being nitpicky, aren't I? I should probably be more forgiving. And in addition to the two function buttons on the front of the camera, there's other things that you can program to make the user experience a little bit more personalized as well. By far my favorite and most used button on the Z6 is the I button. The I button brings up a quick menu that you can fully customize to put all the stuff that you really need to get to super fast. It works very well. It's a good implementation and I had no complaints about it. I really like the I button. I want my own I button. I want, I want branded I button shirts and hats. You know, I will, I will shout the benefits of the I button from mountaintops. Nikon's implementation of their user settings on the mode dial works really, really good. I love the fact that you can have different settings for photo and video under each one, so they'll actually change depending on which mode you're in. If you're in photo mode, you can have one set of settings under U1, and if you're in video mode, you can have different settings under the same little dial. It's very convenient and really well thought out, although I did find that I put all of my favorite settings on the second one because U2, you know, Bono and the Edge, 
rocks. I was pushing it with that one. Battery life on this guy was not as well as I would have liked to have seen, but it wasn't terrible. Uh, it did get in my way. I only had one battery when I was testing this camera out, so I did have to stop and recharge that battery several times. It performed as expected. It definitely did not last as long as the Sony a7 III, that big giant battery that they've got. You're probably going to want to have two or three batteries just to keep on you, because one battery is not going to last a full day of shooting, especially if you do video. Now, this is the same style battery that they've had in previous cameras, but they did update it so that the current battery can actually be charged in the camera, but only the updated version, the older versions that you might have had for older Nikon cameras, they will still work in the camera, but you can't charge them in the camera because the technology won't allow it. Stupid technology. And as I did mention earlier, it does have a silent shooting mode that uses the electronic shutter. It works very, very well. You don't really see a lag in performance. In fact, as I was saying before, you might see a increase in performance when using the electronic shutter, but be very aware that the rolling shutter is bad. It's kind of shaky. Now I do want to talk about my less than enjoyable experiences with the white balance on the Z6. The auto white balance for the Z6 is terrible. I haven't run across a camera that had this bad an auto white balance in a long time. Years years and years. I found it to be completely and totally unreliable. Now I don't use auto white balance a whole lot, but it is something that I do use if I'm trying to move quickly and I'm moving from one environment to the other environment and I don't want to futz around with, you know, setting my Kelvin or that kind of thing. With the Z6, auto white balance is just not an option. Don't do it. Don't try. It. All of the other white balance options work as expected, however. So there's that. One of my favorite things about this camera is time lapses. Nikon has made probably the easiest way to set up a time lapse. It's super fast, super straightforward, and it just works really good. And it gives you two different options in order to make the time lapses. You can do the traditional way where you take all the individual photographs off of the camera, put them into your NLE, and you can edit them all together and squish them down and make a super awesome time lapse that way. Or you can let the camera make it itself inside the camera. Now there are other cameras that will actually make the time lapse inside the camera itself, but there's usually some pretty big trade-offs in quality. With the Z6, it actually puts together a 4K time lapse for you and the quality is ridiculously good. It's one of the best that I've ever seen. In fact, this is the function that I used most often when I made time lapses with this camera. The image quality is actually really good. All the images were really sharp. I was not disappointed at all in that regard. And I love the way that Nikon processes colors. When you're processing the raw files, it just seems like the colors themselves are so much more rich and vibrant than normal. The ISO performance is really good. You can get some great results in low light with this camera. The images are very clean. The noise is controlled all the way up to 12,800. So if you like to photograph vampires in their natural environment, then this camera can do the job. I personally prefer to shoot vampires in the studio, but that's just personal preference. So I never actually ran across a need to shoot over 64 400, so I was really happy with the results. At 6400, the images are super clean. There's a little bit of noise, but the grain, it actually looks very, very natural, and I didn't see a need to actually apply any noise reduction. The dynamic range is good. It works as advertised. You got a lot of room to, you know, pull down your highlights or really lift up those shadows. But of course, just like anything else, if you lift the shadows up too much, you're going to find all kinds of noise. I did find that I had a lot of leeway in the shadows when working with these images, so I was very happy happy with these raw files. The Z-Series camera is the first time that Nikon has actually really done some impressive stuff with video. The Z6 can shoot UHD 4K at up to 30 frames per second with no pixel binning. When you're recording internally to the XQD card, it uses an 8-bit codec, but Nikon has worked some magic here because this is a really good and robust codec. The footage looks absolutely amazing and you have a lot of leeway to push and pull the image in post. I chose to shoot in the flat picture profile and I was not left wanting for dynamic range. I do, however, want a cookie. I'm starving. Mm. 
Oh, sorry. Now, if you have an external recorder and you plug it into the HDMI, it's gonna unlock the 10-bit recording option. This is pretty awesome. Unfortunately, the HDMI is not a full-size HDMI. It's the little, I think it's called the mini HDMI, so it's not as strong a connection. So just be careful when you're using it. You know, maybe if you get a cage for it or some gaff tape or, you know, just pray that it doesn't come out. The 8-bit codec is really robust, and with 10 bits, it's even more robust. How many times did I just say robust? But the 10-bit option is not the only thing that's unlocked. It also lets you use InLog when you're using an external recorder. InLog is Nikon's brand new log profile, and it's a really good one. It reminds me a lot of Canon's C-Log. It's not a crazy, you know, compressed, squishy one, but it's really, really good, and it does give you a lot more room to move with that dynamic range. One thing I need to point out, however, is that the colors in InLog are different than the colors in the other picture profiles inside the camera. To illustrate this, I took some footage of fruit because everybody knows what fruit looks like. Or at least I hope everyone knows what fruit. Anyway, this is the fruit. Now the footage that was shot using the flat profile, I haven't adjusted at all. But the footage that I shot with the in-log, I actually raised the contrast and saturation so that it was more or less similar to the flat profile. I did not adjust the log footage any more than that. Now, in my opinion, the colors coming from the log profile look more accurate. However, from the flat profile, it looks more appealing. That's just how I see it. You might actually think the exact opposite. Now, this really isn't that big a deal unless you're trying to match log footage to footage that was shot in, say, the flat profile. If you need to match those up in post, you're gonna have to do a lot of manipulation to try and make them look similar. Now, normally, the manufacturer would actually have an official LUT that you could add to the log profile to bring it into the color space that they would like it to be in. And if that was the case with Nikon, then it would probably put it in a similar color space as the flat picture profile. However, Nikon has not yet released an official LUT for the in-log profile. Now, the autofocus system in video worked really, really good. It's pretty impressive, actually. When I was using the single point focusing and then utilizing the touch to focus on the screen, I got some nice focus pull looking things. It was cinematic. Yeah. The face tracking and subject tracking modes worked ridiculously well in video. It was... I, I, I used those a lot, actually, because they worked so well. The subject tracking worked especially well. I could put it on a subject and let them just go all over the place and wander around, and, you know, I could zoom in and zoom out while this was happening, and it would not lose focus. It just stayed right on there. It did an amazing job. It also very rarely would lose the subject. Even if something passed in between the camera and the subject, it would just kind of wait for a second and go right back to the subject. You would just say, hey, that's the subject and it would grab it. it would just grab it and hold on. Just, argh, just holding on. Argh. Unfortunately, it suffers from the issues that we talked about earlier when we were talking about the tracking in photo. It does not like low light and it does not like backlit subjects. Other than that, it's an amazing system. Nikon has stated that they will be adding the eye autofocus system in a future firmware update, but it was not available while I was testing the camera. And because Nikon is paying way more attention to the video side of things, they actually have things like focus peaking and zebra stripes to, you know, just to help out the whole, you know, video procedure. Unfortunately, I couldn't figure out a way to use focus peaking and zebra stripes at the same time. Maybe that was just me, but I couldn't, I, I couldn't figure it out. There's also a function where you can punch in and it digitally zooms in so you can actually get a really clear idea and, you know, get critical focus if you're manually focusing, which is great. That's an awesome feature, but it doesn't work when you're actually recording. So if you need to change your focus while you're recording a shot, you can't. It can shoot in full HD, 1080p at up to 120 frames per second. So all the Canadian vloggers will be super excited. The 1080 footage is actually really, really nice. It's some solid 1080. So if you don't want to deal with the 4K workflow, this is some really good 1080. I'm not disappointed at all. It's very sharp, very usable. The same holds true for the 120 frames per second footage. It looks fantastic. Taking the 120 frames per second footage and upscaling it in a 4K timeline looked great. It actually held up ridiculously well. Most people will never notice that this was 1080 and then upscaled. Just a quick word of warning, a lot of the picture profiles have some weird digital sharpening added to them, so if you're gonna shoot, especially at 120 frames per second, just go in there, turn that sharpening down, and you won't regret it. 
it will make everything look much better. If you want to sharpen something up, do it in post or do whatever you want. I can't tell you what to do. You are the master of your own destiny. The low light performance in video was also really impressive. I shot these examples using the 8-bit codec recording internally to the XQD card in the flat picture profile. I have done no post-production to this whatsoever. This is exactly as it came out of the camera. The noise is really minimal and very well controlled all the way up to 6400. I would say the footage is still usable at 12,800, but you might want to add a little bit of noise reduction in post at this point. Now, as we keep going higher, you're going to start noticing a whole lot more noise and you're going to see some color shifting and some saturation issues here. It is actually really impressive how much detail it retains, even when you're pushing that ISO all the way up to 12,800. I didn't see any smearing or artifacting until we got past that. That's pretty awesome. Now, because I needed to use the Z6 in some low light situations for video, I shot these clips just to see how well it would perform. The focusing did have some issues with hunting during the low light situations here. I did just switch it to manual so I could get the shots that I needed to get. These are all shot between 1600 and 6400 ISO. They look ridiculously clean. I was very pleased with the results and I had no problem using this camera for client work. Now again, because Nikon is paying way more attention to the video side of things, you know, they obviously had to make sure that there was a microphone input and a headphone output so you can monitor that audio. Unfortunately, if you plug in a microphone microphone to this camera, the preamps are terrible. They're awful. Now, at first I didn't think that was going to be that big a deal. I could just go into the settings, turn the preamp down as low as it can go before it turns off and then use a microphone that has its own preamp built in, boost it up from there and I should get a good signal, right? Unfortunately, even though we had a really nice signal coming from the microphone itself, it was going through the circuit inside the camera. Now that circuit wasn't designed as well as it could have been and that made it sound super, super thin and super, super weak. And because of that, there's not a viable workaround to the audio issue in this camera. So if you are going to have audio synced to your video, you're gonna to have to record it with an external recorder, like one of these guys maybe. That would make it sound a whole lot better and then you could just sync it in post. That would solve the problem. It's not ideal, but that's what you're gonna to have to deal with. Now Nikon's got an app so you can transfer images from the camera to your phone. It's called SmartBridge. It wasn't that difficult or confusing to connect the camera to the phone and start transferring files. Unfortunately, it only lets you transfer JPEGs. I don't know why this is still the case. We all have Lightroom on our phones now, right? So why not let us just get the raw images so we can just start editing on our little phones? You can also use the app as a remote control to take some photos. And in this case, it worked really, really well. You can adjust all of the settings of the camera. It actually overrides the settings in the camera. You set it from the phone, you hit the button, it takes the picture. It's great. You can even set a timer so you can press the button, you know, wait a second, you know, ah, let's make the smiley face, whatever, whatever you want to do, it works good. If you want to use it as a remote control for video, Video, it also overrides all of the settings on the camera, but it doesn't let you change anything. So it just basically turns video onto auto and then the, you know, focusing system into auto and then you don't get to change. You can start it and stop it, but you don't get to, to it. That was frustrating. Otherwise, the app actually worked pretty well. It could definitely use some improvement, but it's definitely not the worst one I've ever used. Now, Nikon also makes the FTZ adapter. What that means is you can take the, all the old DSLR lenses from Nikon's lineup and adapt them onto the new Z system cameras with no compromise in functionality. This is really cool because Nikon has some amazing lenses. And because some of these lenses are older lenses, you can get some really good prices on these as well. And everyone likes to save a buck unless you're a hunter, then you would shoot the buck. So is this a good camera for you? Who is this camera for? If you already own Nikon lenses and maybe some old Nikon cameras and you wanna move into the mirrorless system, then this is a no-brainer. Can't be a no-brainer. You actually have to have a brain. That's how you process thoughts. That's how you regulate your breathing. Like you can't live without a brain. It's a really good decision. If you shoot a lot of video and you're really looking to get 10-bit full-frame footage, then this is one of the only options that you've got right now. There might be some more in the future, but right now, Nikon's got that one locked down, locked down. And that's not even considering the fact that they are going to add raw video to this camera, raw video. And that is super cool. 
Super cool. Overall, the Z6 is a fantastic camera, even with its shortcomings. Nikon did an amazing job here. This really does not feel like a first generation system, and it really competes with the third generation Sony a7 III. Even if this camera, the Z6, is not the best one for you, you definitely want to keep an eye on Nikon because they're killing it right now. If the Z6 is the camera for you, I do have some links in the description below. They are affiliate links, so if you use those, it really helps out the channel, and I really appreciate it because I want to continue to make videos like this for you. If you like this video, do the thing where the thumb goes up. If you did not like this video, do the thing where the thumb goes down and then, you know, you'll have to deal with my disdain. I am disdaining you. Is disdaining a word? I do a video every week where I'm going to talk about cameras. I'll do reviews as well as tutorials, that sort of thing. If you want to see more of that, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and gotta ring the bell. If you don't ring the bell, then you don't get notified. If you don't get notified, then what was the point of subscribing? I don't get why there's two systems, but there are two systems, so follow the systems. And that is everything I got for you today, so you can take whatever camera you have. It might be your phone, it might be this thing. You might buy the Z6 and take it outside into the world and go make something awesome. Yeah!